Welcome to Grails 2 by Proof. My name is Kevin Rose. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Proof. Joining me is Grails curator Eli Scheinman. Eli, welcome. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Really excited for today. Dude, so great to have you, man. You spent so much work building this out, gathering these artists, herding the cats. There's, <laughs> yeah. There's, there's a lot to... Yeah, it's super fun to get to this day. And this reveal, this whole show is going to be really fun. Yeah, absolutely. And of course... I'm also joined by Collector, 100 Proof co-host, and Collab Currency Managing Partner, Derek Edwards. Derek, so great to have you. Kevin, Eli, I am stoked to be here. This is going to be a trip. I can't wait to go on it with you guys. Uh, a testament to all the hard work you've done and all the amazing work that's going to be shown today. So very excited to be a part of it. Thanks for letting me join along. Yeah, well, it's great to have you because you wear so many different hats. Like You invest in a lot of great Web3 projects. Uh, but you're also just a stellar collector, and I know you own a lot of the people we're going to be chatting to about I, today. I do own some of the work. So yeah, excited to, to piece it all together and, and go through it with the group. Yeah, let's do it. So let's kick things off with an introduction to Grails. The concept behind Grails is simple. 25 artists, 25 works of art, but the art is anonymous, that is, until today. Now that minting is complete, it's time to reveal who the artists are behind the 25 artworks. But before we jump into the reveal, let's take a trip down memory lane and check out the original collection. Uh, obviously, some, some big moments that happened during Grails 1. Uh, who do you want to cover first? Yeah, so let's, uh, let's talk about Tyler Hobbs and his contribution to Grails 1 mm -hmm. wall. This was such a fun piece. Uh, people thought it was initially a photograph and turned out to be this generative work, and really an example of Tyler challenging what's possible in terms of replicating something in the physical with a generative algorithm. So yes. such a fascinating work. I myself, before I was working with Proof, spent many an hour uh, trying to figure out who the artist was behind that work, and you know, thought I had figured it out as being Tyler. So you know, a really memorable piece, an important piece in many ways. Yeah, I loved this piece, um, not least of which Tyler is most well known for being this amazing long form generative artist. And this work itself was a generative piece, but it played with expectations. Nobody ever could have imagined that yeah. this was Tyler um, because of the, the medium of which it was being uh, conveyed through, which is a single piece that you could mint. Um, and I, you know, this idea of it being a generative piece and it being Tyler, and it's really just, it shows how special the Grail space is for artists to come in who are immensely creative and pursue different creative places in their own journey uh, and be able to create work that they normally wouldn't be able to create. Yeah. I, I love that this was an actual location in Austin, uh, Texas. Yeah. yeah. And that there was actually some of the collectors of this piece that went down recently, met up with Tyler, and being the just amazing human that he is, you know, we've met him, he's amazing, uh, just did a photo opportunity it's outside so cool. of the actual so awesome. wall. So, so yeah. cool. Yeah. Very, very cool. Uh, next up. Yeah, so uh, we had a piece from Itch Shells, mm -hmm. top-selling uh, female NFT artist of all time. I think it was Grail 15 in the first season. Subtle animation, beautiful colors. That was one of my favorite pieces aesthetically from season one. Uh, such a thrill to have a, a work from her and a really memorable piece. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, very special piece with the, with the black background and the, the gradient colors moving yeah. in and out of frame. It was a very, uh, very awesome piece. Yeah. It's beautiful. I, I have not collected that one yet, and it is on my laundry yeah. list of things to go back and, and, and try and find yeah. a, a reasonable entry point for that <laughs> yeah. particular piece. But yeah, uh, beautiful artwork and, and so great to have, have her on yeah. the original Grails. Yeah, so the next piece is from Dmitry Cherniak. One of the reasons I love this work is that it really leaned in to what Grails is. So this was a, a photograph that Dmitry submitted, I think he took in 2019 in Korea. And so it was more or less impossible to identify as having been his work. By extension, it was minted not that much, I think 30 times. And so just, I think, his work and having him involved is sort of representative of one of the things we want to accomplish yeah. with Grails. Yeah, so special. Most well-known for Ringers, of course, Eternal Pump. Uh, he's been this force uh, 
even back in you know the 10 years ago around Instagram, around generative art, um, and for him to put out a, a photo piece yeah. as his first photo NFT, really special, and gets back to what I was saying, artists are trusting the Grails platform mm -hmm. to be able to explore these different creative um, uh, lines of effort that they, um, that they have as artists. And so it's a testament to what you guys have built here. I guess one of the things that we, we should cover is, is certainly how do we select today's artists? Like a lot of people ask us that. Many of today's artists were selected by our original Grails One artist, which was very cool. And we also chatted with some of the most respected collectors in the NFT space. And then finally, we even polled our Twitter audience as well. Now, for this Grails release, we issued minting passes to the Proof Collective, which is 1,000 members. And we also offered minting passes to nested moonbirds with the Grail attribute above their head, which total nested was 172. Now, as a thank you to participating artists, we also gave them their Genesis Mint, so their very first mint of their Grail too, and then one additional mint. But until this moment, all artist information was kept secret. Not even the artists knew who else was participating. Now for my mint, and also Derek for your mint, we spun this random wheel on Twitter spaces. We did it live. Uh, I was uh, selected Grail 16, which we'll get into later, which was really awesome for me. And Derek, which one did you? I was number see? eight. Number eight. Yep. Okay. And Eli, you did something insanely stupid, uh, generous. <laughs> I mean, a little bit of both. Yeah. But the, you gave yours away. I did. Yeah, I gave mine away, uh, which was really fun because it, it allowed, <laughs> really dumb, fun, allowed someone else to sort of have fun and engage with this whole experience. Yeah. And in the replies to that, that tweet announcing that I was giving it away, it was so cool to see people engaging with all of those works, talking about the different dimensions and elements that they really resonated with. So that was really fun. Yeah, yeah. So, so fun or stupid. Yeah, very, mm. very, very thoughtful and kind of you to do that. <laughs> All right, so let's get into some Grails 2 artist stats. Collectively, we estimate a total of 125 million in combined NFT sales for these artists, with five of the 25 in double digit million dollars in sales. We have one artist today that is dropping their Genesis NFT and three artworks that will transform slightly after the reveal. Also worth mentioning, five artists have been featured as curated artists on art blocks, and seven artists have had their artwork sold by Christie's or Sotheby's. All right, you guys ready to do this? Let's do it. Let's go. Okay, let's get into it. The very first artist, Louise Ponce. Yeah, so Luis is a Mexican artist based in Montreal, Canada, uh, and they're really known for mixing techniques and styles from illustration to motion graphics to 3D. And their practice is informed by post-humanism and crypto culture and post-cyberpunk uh, ethos and, and, um, and characters. All right, so this one here, obviously beautiful. How would you describe something like this? Because it, it is a little bit glitch, right? Yeah, definitely cypherpunk glitch art, uh, very aggressive, in your face. Uh, there's something very crypto native about this work that I just love. The use of color uh, is just, it's just very much in your face and, and, and ready to rock. And I, I love this work. Uh, and it's, it's clear to me why he's found a place in uh, the crypto art canon. I'm, I'm really excited for digital frames to kind of catch up to the amazing artwork that mm. we're seeing. Yeah. Because when I see something like this, it, it is really, there's so much going on here. You could just sit here and kind of get lost in it and, and discover new little attributes. I was looking, the little scrolling text at the top there, it says, uh, trust no one or something like that. Proof is the trust at the very top. So like, cool. Coming out of the VR headset. Yeah, it's a very, very cool piece. And then moving on to, to this one here, uh, another 35 ETH sale on Super Rare, collected by Cosmo. W let's talk about the influence Cosmo has on the mm. industry. Yeah, I mean... It, it's there's something about this global technology, the fact that we all have these assets that we can peer into and see who owns what at any given moment, where the top collectors are starting to play somewhat of a curator's role. Mm -hmm. And so when Cosmo starts collecting this work early on in the artist's career, I think Cosmo has two or three pieces. Uh, it starts to put kind of a, a stamp of approval on, on the artist, on the piece, on the work, and gets people talking. Like, what's going on here? What, should, what are we missing? What can we explore and dive into around the piece and this artist? Yeah, it's, it's interesting when you think about the traditional art world and the role of the art critic and then also the role of the gallery that's putting it up, um, the auction houses as well. Like Each of those playing a pretty big part in 
the worth and in, in, in notoriety for some different artists that are up and coming, because to your point of everything being so transparent, you can see mm. what people are collecting. And I've noticed that you know when Cosmo collects something, it, people will track this with bots, and they see right. when something is bought, and they immediately buy right after. Yes. And it, it's crazy, it, but it's also kind of awesome at the same time. It, but it, it's elevating this idea of a celebrity kind of collector, uh, which we really haven't seen before in this way. It's, it's pretty awesome. Tell me about this one, Eli. Yeah, so this is really cool. This is that first piece, Primitive Agents of Change, and a collaboration with an outstanding uh, coffee table producer. And you can just imagine that first piece that we saw on this coffee table in front of us. How insane that would be it goes to your uh, comment about Sort of when frames catch up, and you can imagine sort of when things are packaged in the right way, yeah. that we get to engage with them in a slightly more tangible manner and sort of in our daily lives, some of the work really comes alive. So, so I just think that's a really cool representative example. Yeah, beautiful. All right, let's uh, take a look at the grail. All right, so here it is. This is grail number 10. What are we looking at here, Eli? Yeah, this is so cool. So Luis submitted this, uh, this video of their process. And so we're seeing this come alive. It's just incredible to see all the tiny details, the animation, and the way that starts sort of with these primary components. And then you'll see in a moment that the background starts to fill in. Just totally outstanding. It's very cool. I just, every time I see the creation process like this, I, in my head, I'm like, why don't I have that skill set? Like, it's so... <laughs> Epic to watch because I, I used to play around with 3D uh, apps back in the day, but this is just next level, obviously. Look at that. Yeah, and there it is. And that little face hidden in the background there is so good. Yeah. And then the little guy here on the right. So, so cool. Yeah. I mean, this is definitely one where when I see it hit, it's uh, as a collector, it speaks to me. So I, I certainly want to go on the secondary market now that I'm able to and try and pick one of these yeah. up. All right. So let's take a look at it. Here it is. Grail number 10. Luis Ponce, congratulations to whoever minted this. Yes. It, is, it is just stunning. It's beautiful. beautiful. Yeah, definitely one I'm going to try and pick up in the secondary market. Um, the title is Ambivalence. Uh, description is Oscillating Between Extremes. And we'll have even a more detailed description up on the, yes. the website and on the NFT itself. So beautiful. Very cool. So thank you, Luis, for being a part of this very special piece. All right, let's move on. Osanachi. Okay, so Osanachi is a 30-year-old artist from Lagos, Nigeria. He's really known as one of the sort of both first and foremost crypto artists from Africa. So super thrilled to have him involved in, in Rails this time around. His work interrogates his personal experiences through his technological background and his really deep embeddedness in that world. Uh, he's been shown at Christie's in their post-war and contemporary art auction. And his works have uh, combined six million dollars or more uh, on, on Super Rare. So very cool. Totally beautiful work. Absolutely. Look at the little one thing you might may not notice by looking at this at first glance is it's actually animated. The little clock there, uh, the chess clock down in the corner is the only thing that's animated there. Yeah, super subtle. And he has a really you know distinct style in many ways, but also is able to play with different colored. Uh, and different themes uh, in such an interesting way. Yeah, here's one titled The Future is Female, 22 E. I mean, just absolutely gorgeous stuff. I, I love the animation there. It, it's so cool. Yeah. And let's take a look at it then. This is Grail number 21 in the air. I love this. It's such a cool piece. I mean, the jacket uh, and the pattern there, and then the subtle animation behind. Yeah, it says here the description gas masks were extensively used during the First and Second World Wars. Although it's rarely talked about, Africans played a huge role in both wars, which means they must have been handed gas masks at some point to go out into the war front and face the enemies. Yet a cursory search on the internet shows that there is hardly any image of an African wearing a gas mask in these wars. Why? Very cool. I, I think there's something so interesting about Osanachi. Uh, you you know uh, you know it's an Osanachi when you look at the piece. Uh, there's definitely the elements of the characters uh, that he portrays in his work that are very prevalent stylistically through all the works uh, that Osanachi creates. Uh, but there's always something a bit haunting in the background, or a question, or some deliberate focus on uh, on a moment in time or a moment in history that leaves the uh, the audience or the viewer asking asking more about the work. Mm -hmm. And this one is no exception. 
uh, I'm excited myself to dig into this one and, and, and learn a little bit more about the creative process and the thought process yeah. on this gas mask motif. All right. Well, thank you so much and congrats to everyone. They got to know Sinachi. Beautiful piece. Next up, Jake Freed. Yeah, so Jake Freed, uh, US-based visual artist, and he's really known for his mind-bending animations using black ink and whiteout to create what he calls hallucinatory vistas. And I just love that term, so good. Uh, Jake's works have been auctioned at Christie's. He was in the recent MAPS auction mm. uh, with some of our other um, friends in the space. And he's exhibited at the Tate Modern and done commissions for Netflix, Adult Swim, and, and shown work at galleries throughout the world. And this one here is sold for 72 ETH. Um, beautiful piece. Yeah, and that, that one was, was part of the Christie's auction that we just saw. And this one, I mean, wow. Yeah, paper trail. Very cool. Fantastic. Yeah, really, I mean, the detail work here is just outstanding. And we cut together a little video for the reveal. Um, let's take a look at it. So I began my career as a painter, and through the course of reworking my images and paintings over and over again, I realized that I'm more interested in the way an image evolves over time than any final painting. And this led me to animation, where I would redraw and repaint the same image over and over again, reporting it as I go, to create these really unique and elaborate and dense personal experimental films. So in the same way that a traditional painter might have a sketchbook to take reference drawings or to think about different compositions for their artwork when they're away from the studio, I do this with flipbooks. I made this mostly in the Peace Ball on a train to teach at a school that's in the suburbs of Boston where I live. I can animate in real time and then see it while I'm making it. But it's a terrible long-term art object, right? Like this thing, by the time it's done and I made it, it's all flayed out. And what I love about this piece is that it's handmade. It's got all these flaws and imperfections. And when you're working on a train and kind of commuting, it just has all these quirks and you have to give up. And that control that I, and that, that intense perfectionism that I put into my traditional work. Animation for me is really puzzle solving more than anything. It's important to remember that it's about the illusion of movement. It's tricking the eye and the brain to, to think something is moving and to feel that movement. I always think of F-Zero or Mario Kart or some sort of video game, racing game, where the character in the car is in the middle of the page or in the middle of the screen. And really what's being moved is the background. To me, ultimately, this piece is really just a meditation on the illusion of movement what animation is and how a seamless loop can be more than just a repeating motion. It's about always moving forward, right? This piece never is never going to end. It's never going to stop. It's always pushing forward. Just we are always pushing forward and trying to move forward in the space and in life. It might actually inspire you or give you energy. So, <laughs> I know, it's one of those things where I, so I hadn't seen this video and, um, you know, just till a few days ago. Yeah. This was all coming together. And, and Mao, our, our video and all things audio, like, superstar, was like, hey, I cut this together. Take a look. Yeah. And I hit play and I saw this and I was like, well, now I need to own that. Like, I need to collect that. That's awesome. <laughs> and then I spun that wheel, and this was the one I ended up with. Yeah. Amazing. So it's very cool. Yeah. yeah, I love seeing the process. Hearing Jake talk about this work in particular. Uh, congratulations, Kevin. Yes. And others for minting this piece. Yes, absolutely. The title is Ball, and it was hand-drawn animation with ink on paper. Very cool. So this was only 17 mints. So that's going to be really interesting, right? Because this was tied for the fewest number of mints, which means that, I don't know, we've got to play with this dynamic around scarcity on these things too, right? That's a really fun piece of grails is you kind of like, and you saw this, yeah. everyone minted the last day. Yeah. Because everyone's like sitting there being like, okay, where's, where's the tide going? Where's, where's right, everyone right. you know, moving to? And, and then, yeah, so I'm really stoked. Like, one, I get that amazing video that goes with this I'll always have. And two, now it's one of the, the fewest, yeah. which is like awesome. Yeah, so cool. Very cool. All right, let's move on. Thank you, Jake. Very excited to collect my first piece of yours. So that is awesome. Um, this artist 
Neurocolor, I've actually collected before. Right, yeah. Someone I bought personally off of Super Rare about a year ago. So I'm really thrilled to have Neurocolor uh, join us here. And I'm actually be, uh, going to one of their mints out there uh, in Mexico City, which you'll be at as well. I will be there. And yeah, I'm, it's I'm very bright excited moments. To, to meet Neurocolor and, and learn a little bit more about their process and their work. Yeah. Look at this stuff. One, one Incredible. You, once you get into Neurocolor, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like... Very, very cool stuff. This type of work was really meant to be put up big on display on a screen. Mm. And as the proliferation of screens continues to get better and more, uh, more apparent and with more options, we're going to start seeing works like this everywhere. I think Neurocolor, God, this is just meant to be blown up very big, yeah. put up somewhere that everyone can enjoy, um, but so rich uh, and so... Um, I guess like uh, there's something very crypto native about work mm -hmm. like this that just really speaks to me. Mm -hmm. um, I'm am excited for for this for this grail. Yeah, yeah it's it's cool to like look at this and it, whenever I see a neurocolor, I, I almost feel like I'm transported to like an alien world. Like that top bit right there, what we're looking at right now, like that could easily be like some type of alien scanner that's like looking over the surface of something. <laughs> like it's like very <laughs> yeah, like yeah. I get a little hint of sci-fi, like like you know our predator or something, right. like rotating skulls, like in like heat map skulls and stuff like that. It's, it's really, really cool. And of course, I love little Japanese hints, little touches in there. Mm. You know, it's pretty awesome. Look at this one, though. Yeah, I mean, you know, of all of these works, I think this one maybe alludes to their grail the most. Mm -hmm. uh, but, I mean, the animation here, again, to your point, Derek, sort of the crypto-nativeness of this work and, and some of that, that glitch that's happening there, uh, you know, such an interesting piece. Such a master of color, too. I mean, just the, even the diversity of, of the palette across these yeah. different uh, the, um, formats and these different quadrants and, and stages is so interesting to look at. You kind of have to be if you're going to call yourself Neurocolor. Yes, right. that's true. Pretty good at that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's take a look. Grail number 23. There it is. I thought this was hot. This is yeah. Nice. God, this is such a cool piece. It almost feels like there's some liquid nature to this, mm. like something very organic. Um, Almost like you're inside of the sea watching the reef uh, or, or mm. you know, something organic in the sea moving very elegantly, uh, yet such uh, tonality around crypto-ness and crypto-nativeness. It's such a powerful piece. I really like this one. Yeah, yeah the title is uh, Retinal Plugin Description Neural Pattern Formation Cloud Update in Progress. I love that. I love yeah. the description. Yeah. Alone. In yeah. progress. So good. All right. Moving on. Grant Rivignon. Okay, so Grant is originally from San Jose, California, now based in Milwaukee. And you know, his work is quite distinct because he really leans into these, uh, these themes around minimalism and uh, landscapes and architecture and interior design. This piece here, um, so, so interesting. Again, really restrained yeah. uh, and, and minimal. Uh, but also really impactful. This is called the Alien, sold for 137 ETH. Now, one you know really interesting thing about Grant is all of his work is CC0. Mm. So I've seen some incredible interpretations of cow, which we're looking at now, mm. from all sorts of folks in the space who are experimenting and taking forward this work uh, in their own interpretations. So that's been really fun to observe with Grant's work. Do you own any of Grant's work at all, Derek? I don't. I've actually, we, we've started collecting in Flamingo, and I think there's two themes around Grant, uh, or, or, or two movements that he most often refers back to. I think he identifies as a, a neo-precisionist. Uh, precisionist. Uh, so taking from the pr precisionist movement, uh, which is really focused on like different vantage points, very sharp, angular looks, or unique, um, uni a unique lens by which to view an ordinary object or an ordinary setting, and then this idea of American regionalism, which mm. is uh, really a response to the 1930s uh, and some of what we were seeing in America around that time, especially in the Midwest, um, which was a, a movement that was really formed to kind of cultivate this, this heartwarming feeling around some of the more natural objects and natural settings. Um, and I think he's really converged there with mm. his art style. It's, it's, uh, he'll take like an ordinary landscape or an ordinary setting and marry that with this precisionist um, style to, to lead itself to kind of this rebirth, this, this new movement or a re-movement around, um, around those two modalities. So it's been fun to kind of watch him work. And I'm, I'm definitely interested in, in starting to collect some, yeah, some advanced my... stuff. Yeah, Very cool. Well, okay, let's take a look at it. Grail number two, Grant Riven Young, title of the store. Beautiful piece. Yeah. 
I mean, you know, people were uh, thought it might be his work. And, uh, you know, I'm just so thrilled to have Grant in this season. As you said, beautiful work. Yeah, and it's from their series, Life in Japan is the name of the series it came from. And so this had never, obviously never been minted before, but I think somebody was able to find it somewhere, right? It just goes to show like the sleuthing that goes on That's right. behind the scenes. If it's out there, the proof community will find it. I think someone did find this uh, amongst Grant's works on his website. Um, but, but that aside, a, a beautiful work. And so thrilled to have Grant uh, in this season. And so, so I can't, iconically Grant as well. Like yeah. this is very much the shading on the trees, um, the, the look dead on um, of the store itself, um, like the very like placid nature of the scene around it. This is such a, a Grant Yoon work uh, that it's, uh, I think folks would have figured it out sooner rather than later. Yeah, fantastic. All right, next artist, James Jean. Yeah, so James is a, a Taiwanese uh, American artist, and he's known for fusing a variety of different styles. So he's got this uh, inspiration from traditional Chinese scroll paintings, Japanese woodblock prints, and then some Renaissance work as well. And he brings those together in such a dynamic way. Uh, the piece we're looking at now, Slingshot, uh, you know, again, it's really refined or sort of constrained but also so impactful. I, I love this work. Yeah, this one here sold for 158 ETH. Um, definitely uh, a really cool one. And then check this out. Yeah, this is just insane. Uh, the palette here, and again, like some of that allusion to some of these historical uh, modalities and themes, but really brought through a contemporary lens, I think is really impactful and interesting. And then, yeah, James does a, you know, quite a few movie posters as well. Uh, and so, you know, this is one example of the type of diversity and variety of his work. This one in particular is really fun. The Thanks. movie's incredible. And I actually, I didn't realize that, that James had designed this poster, but his style, his brain is so perfect for the, the, the complexity of what that movie had to offer. This poster is amazing um, and very much like the right artist to be designing the, the work for it. All right. Let's Shall, you guys ready? Let's do it. This is the, I wouldn't have guessed this. Grail number 12. Such a cool piece. Yeah, I mean, I don't know uh, too much more beyond uh, the description that we have here from, from James, but uh, you know, relative to some of those other works we saw, the fact that this is very clearly alluding to something that will sort of take a more complete form in the mm -hmm. future, I love. Yeah. I sort of love being able to see through his eyes as he's starting to work on something new. And that really comes through very clearly in this piece. Yeah, so the title is Dragon Preliminary Study. And this is a preliminary sketch and color study for a physical painting that I will make soon, is the description. Very cool. Yeah, thank you, James. Yes. All right, next artist, Justin Arvisano. The Beast. Yes. We love Justin, friend of the show. Everyone in, in, uh, in, the, in the proof community knows of Justin, but certainly outside of the proof community as well. He's probably most well known for Twin Flames. It's um, one of the earliest recorded works of photography on blockchain. Um, he has been a total powerhouse in building that movement up uh, the, where NFTs and Web3 and photography really come together. Yeah. So much so that he even went on to co-found Quantum Art, which really pioneered this idea of becoming a vertical marketplace for photography NFTs. Mm -hmm. The volume there has been insane. Justin himself has been a longtime creator, uh, and has, has done an amazing job of always trying to stitch together his different works mm. and so that there's a through line that exists from the very first work that he's ever minted through today's work. Mm -hmm. um, he's a, an exceptional creative talent, and it's so awesome to see him in Grails. Yeah, a Twin Flames uh, collection has done over 5,000 ETH in secondary sales on OpenSea. Wow. It actually still has a 68 ETH floor. Unreal. Even given everything that's been going on with this, this bear market. <laughs> but um, yeah, absolutely stoked to have him. Uh, one of the best networkers I know of. You know, Incredible. Just, and yeah. it's been it's Sotheby's and Christie's and just all over the place. So really made a, a pretty serious reputation for himself in a very short amount of time. Yes. So here's a, a few more of his pieces of art. Yeah, this work from Terror Scrolls. This work yeah. here, uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, Kevin, this is the Cognition series mm -hmm. uh, that, that Justin started working on, I think, over a decade ago and just released, and there's a, a physical exhibition of this work uh, at Venus over Manhattan Oh wow! in early September. 
Yeah, so that's the same gallery that, that Snowfrows had. Uh, that's right. Squiggles had. I mean, um, obviously, they've represented such great artists in the yes. past. Yeah. Adam Lindemann, who runs Venus Over Manhattan, has done a tremendous job of identifying the top talent in some of these verticals. Eric Snowfro for generative art, Justin A. Rosano for photography. And so it is uh, very much you know, the old guard. The, the, the folks that people trust are now starting to come into this space and bridge that gap between um, you know, contemporary art of the last 20, 30 years and some of the new and up and coming artists that are really using the Web3 palette. Yeah. And so it's been awesome to see Adam Lindemann, Venus over Manhattan take such a heavy hand in this area. Yeah, and Adam's one of these uh, people that, you know, in the traditional art world is, is like really well respected. Definitely. Mm -hmm. if, it is, if, this is, if he's paying attention to your art, that's a, that's a big deal. Yes. And so kind of like we were talking with Cosmo earlier, like yeah. that, he's that for the tra 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 yes. traditional art world. So, um, all right. So, here we go. This one is, uh, you know, which one was Justin's? Like, it's not obvious right yeah. away, but it was Grail number 24. Number 24. And some people uh, thought this might be the case. Uh, and, and we were very clear that this would be the only piece that would really wholly change. Mm -hmm. And so, Kevin, if you go to the next slide, we'll see. Yes. Let's see the final piece. There we go. So this is the front of that canvas that we just showed. Uh, Cognition Zero Returning Home by Justin Aversano. Yeah, so this is, you mentioned that Cognition series earlier. So this is the very, very first one. That's right. Well, it's sort of the first, but it's also its own, its own thing. It's uh, like the artist copy, right? Is it, would you say, or? Well, it's a little bit different in that uh, there were 365 of these physical canvases, right? Mm -hmm. And one of those was stolen from Justin's car when he was in Detroit. No way. No and way. so this work in particular, he made for Grails as a way, as he says, to sort of regain his power. Hmm. And so this work is, uh, it lives outside of the other collection and was made wholly for, for this uh, grail season, uh, and now has that moniker of being cognition number zero. That's very cool. Oh, that's awesome. I hadn't realized that. So 364, part of the cognition series. This is 365, but it's now number zero. Does that, that's it, right. That's so cool. And again, the, to the conceptual creativity of Justin, mm -hmm. he always finds a way to stitch together his work so that there's this through line across everything that he's ever done, which has been so awesome to watch. Yeah. Yeah. And we're going to do two really, I think, fun things. One, uh, there'll be a POAP of the back of the canvas. You know, people minted the back, and so we'll provide a way for people to sort of have this enduring uh, version of the back of the canvas. And then one person will get this one of one physical of the canvas itself. Oh, wow. So yeah. one of the people that minted is actually going to get the, the That's real right. physical. Yeah, we'll do a raffle in the, the next week or so, uh, and one person will get that physical, which would be super fun. Very cool. Awesome. All right. So great to have Justin involved. Let's move on. Mr. Doodle. Okay, so Mr. Doodle is, uh, he's a British street artist and has a really distinct style. It's busy, it's lighthearted, and he works across canvases, takes over full rooms, uh, works on walls, uh, outside exterior walls. Uh, and his work is characterized by these really tightly packed and visually overwhelming, I mean, you can see it, yeah. uh, arrangements of letters in different forms. He's had work shown all over the world at Sotheby's, and he has over 2.5 million Instagram followers. Wow. Yeah, this one here, The Persistence of Doodling, sold for $200,000 at Phillips. So it was auctioned off. Um, here's another one here, Junk Food Fields. Love that one. Yeah, the palette here is so cool. All right, so this next frame we're going to show is actually the creation of the Grail, right? Yeah, let's take a look. There, there it is. is. There was some incredible speculation around this piece. Uh, and I think we had a couple of team members who were not on the inside actually mint this piece. Uh, and so there it is, Mr. Doodle, Red Skull, Grail number 20. I, I think this is beautiful. This, yeah. this is like, it just feels very street art to me. Mm. And, and I, I, I would love to own this piece. This would be very cool to have in a digital frame somewhere. Or even a print, like an actual print. Of yeah, that. agreed. There's something also very interesting about the layers. So like the street art almost being put on top of other street art mm. to form the final piece. It's almost very much like the medium is now digital art, but he's playing with this idea of what it means to tag over other people's right. work or to put your work on top of someone else's, given the constraints of like these physical walls that you, normal street artists have to operate with them. Fantastic. Awesome. Congrats to everyone that minted Grail number 20. Let's move on to the next artist. 
Linda Dunia. Yeah, so Linda is a self-taught artist and visual designer. She's also a curator, in fact, and curates for Super Rare. Uh, raised in Senegal and, and uh, born and lives there now. Uh, her work really explores social constructions of power, power dynamics, and the implications that has uh, on distributed communities. Uh, her work is really interesting because she brings together her acrylic paintings, her AI modeling based on those paintings, and then some physical prints of that work that she then creates collage with. So a really dynamic process to, to create some of these outputs. The work we're seeing now is from her quantum art release from earlier this year. Mm -hmm. I just love sort of the, the woven texture uh, that, that comes from this, but, but that's also sort of combined with the AI animation. I love when artists, and I'm starting to see, and she was probably an early pioneer here, of feeding their own art back into AI, mm. which is just like, creates some really interesting outputs. Dude, there is something, so, I've, so I was unfamiliar with this artist, but there is something so interesting about these multimedia artists that are playing with m multiple ideas. So this idea of uh, taking her work, training an AI, then taking the outputs of those work and assembling them using collage-based art and then putting it back into Photoshop and starting to rearrange. Like, yeah. the, the, like, the artists that are able to like, capture these different mediums and play with them and push forward uh, work that is just so breathtaking is just awesome to see. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about what it was like to work with her, and uh, especially given that you know, she is uh, a, a someone who is clearly uh, starting to, to make work in, in some pretty prolific places. Yeah, so I mean, uh, there's actually a, some interesting context around our work with Linda that uh, I, I want to share in just a moment. But uh, I think we have a, a really interesting video that we can, we awesome. can show that will lead into that yeah. nicely. Let's do it. I don't know if you've ever been around a neem tree. Regardless of how hot it is, when you stand under it, it's very cool. It has an insane cooling effect. Some of the neem trees have low hanging branches and so you can climb them. So that's where I spend most of my time. Not proud of it, but I was really lazy. I didn't really don't want to work on the farm at all. Like my grandpa and my siblings would be out there and I would just be chilling in the tree. It also, it, it's also a mosquito repellent. Like mosquitoes don't like neem, so you don't really have a lot of insects and bugs around there, which is awesome. I remember my very innocent childlike thoughts was, how come the sparrows don't get hot? They just seem to just be out there on the millet, like under the beating sun at two o'clock. Don't they get hot? <laughs> That's what the title comes from. Just watching them dance in sweltering heat. That's why I call the peace sparrows do not fear the sun. All right, so there it is, grill number five. Sparrows do not fear the sun. It's, yeah. It's, it's awesome. Amazing, yeah. And I love hearing Linda's uh, description of the work. And if you really zoom in on this piece, the textures are so fantastic. Uh, that's what really drew me in initially. And this is a really special piece for a couple of reasons. So uh, this, this work and our work with Linda really started, well, first, from us admiring her and her, her prior practice and sure. her work. But we also had access to this piece that had some historical significance by this woman, Alma Thomas. And so Alma Thomas was sort of significant for a number of reasons. She was the first graduate of Howard University's art department in 1924. She was the first black woman to have a solo show at the Whitney Museum. And she's also the, the first African-American woman to have a work shown in the White House and as part of the White House collection. Wow. What year was that? Do you know? That was very recently. That was in uh, 2015, right? That's right. So the yeah. work was, this work by Alma Thomas was acquired by Michelle Obama for the permanent collection. Mm -hmm. And so we had access to, to do something with that work from Alma. And given our interest and our admiration for Linda's work, Linda reinterpreted this work called Resurrection 1966. And so this work that's, that's now being shown uh, is, is sort of being provided in partnership with both the White House Historical Association and Iconic Moments, who helped facilitate some of this. And what's really cool is anyone who minted Linda's work, Grail Number 5, will also receive Alma Thomas's resurrection as an NFT. Hmm. Wow. They'll also receive a physical, which is really cool. But one, one thing we're going to do on the NFT side is we're going to, com we're going to bind Grail Number 5 and this piece from Alma Thomas, sort of 
one piece is sold, this one follows. And this is new. I've never heard of this before. Like this like idea of binding these two NFTs together. Right. It's a relatively new, I'm not sure what token standard that falls under, but what you're saying is that if this is ever sold, the other NFT automatically goes with it. That's right. Yeah. So, so this piece in and of itself can't be sold on its own, but a holder of rail number five will always inherently hold this one as well. They will move together, which is really cool. Really cool. So let me, I'm curious, let me unpack a little bit of that. How did the White House get involved? Yeah, so we have uh, a partner in Iconic Moments, and they had a pre-existing relationship with the White House. And so what Iconic Moments does is they work with institutions like the Historical Association or other museums to digitize aspects of their collection. And so we worked together to find this one piece in particular that we thought was really beautiful and, and important, frankly, uh, and then sort of started to engage with the White House to bring it to fruition. So at what point did Linda get involved and how was she brought into the conversation and how did she get excited about doing this? Yeah, so once we knew that this was the work we wanted to do something special with for Grails, Linda was an obvious candidate. I was a huge fan of her quantum art release and some of her super rare work. And so we, we presented her with this, this interesting idea of would this make sense for you to potentially reinterpret as part of Grails? Uh, and, and she was totally on board, has been such uh, an incredible partner in bringing this to fruition. So really thrilled to be able to both sort of shine a light on Linda, definitely, and Alma Thomas's prior work and sort of build some connective tissue between their works and the two of them as artists. That's fantastic. We'll have to have Linda on a podcast yeah. and go much deeper on this. So is this the very first NFT that the White House has actually issued? It is. Yeah, I hadn't sort of thought about it in that context, but it is. Uh, and so we're super grateful to the Historical Association and Colleen there. Uh, for working with us to to do this, I think it's you know really interesting and important. That's that's actually pretty epic. That's pretty yeah. epic. It's yeah. the first White House yeah. issued NFT along with an amazing artist on both sides. Like yeah, there's a lot going on story. here. Yeah, incredible story. This is awesome. Yeah, very cool. All right, well that was unexpected and awesome. <laughs> uh, let's move on to the next one. This obviously iconic artist here, Drifter shoots. Yeah, so Drift uh, or Isaac Wright. Uh, he's an honorary retired. Army Special Operations veteran uh, who began shooting photography, which, you know, of course, his, his style is so distinct and recognizable now. He started shooting as a way to cope with both mental illness and PTSD. Mm -hmm. And so these excursions and this format uh, of totally in insane, <laughs> beautiful photography uh, sort of emerged from those conditions. I don't know how you do this to cope <laughs> with stress. Like, if anything, my hands sweat when I, I look too. at photos. Just I, like my hands are sweating right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Especially look at this one here. Like that. That I just don't like that at all. I, I've actually climbed a bridge one time, and it was terrifying. And I was harnessed in and everything. So. Yeah. There's something so interesting about this work, and, and he's most well known for the Where My Vans Go collection. Yes. I think the floor is something between 50 or 60 ETH at this point. Um, and really, they're just shots, a top down of his vans that he's wearing, dangling over these skyscrapers or these incredibly tall structures. Um, he's is a, you know provocative, he's in your face, he's rule breaking. He was incarcerated in 2020, I think it was. Uh, in jail for about a year or so mm -hmm. before he came out and started making work again. He's got an amazing story and um, definitely one of the, the up-and-coming photographers that the, the crypto scene has certainly started to converge around. So yeah. it's been yeah. awesome to watch Drift work. And, and so when he goes out to, to actually take these shots, he's pretty much breaking the law every single time, right? Like this is not stuff that's officially sanctioned that that he's allowed to do. Is that right? Or do we not know? That's my understanding. I think, um, you know, there, I, oftentimes these structures don't want to take the liability of just right. letting mm. someone come up there. And mm. so I would also say from an artistic perspective, he just, I, I, I get the sense that the work wouldn't be the same right. if mm. there wasn't some element to it that was provocative and pushing boundaries. Yeah, you mean um, he might die, basically, <laughs> is what it comes down. I mean, that's what's that's what is, true. He's true. tempting fate right here. Um, you know? But I think that that adds to the the gravitas of him and the work, and why I think all of us are just looking at this palm sweating, so interested in and in where his vans are going to go next. Yeah, awesome stuff. Thrilled that he is uh, partaking and is is actually doing a grail with us. And he is grail number 13. There it is. Do you have any background, any more information on this shot? Or is he cryptic? Yeah, so Drift's been 
been quite cryptic about this piece in particular. I think some people uh, were able to find it. You know, again, not, not too surprising given the proof folks and the type of research they do. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, such an evocative piece and, and very different in many ways to Where My Vans Go or some of his other work, but still, again, provocative and impactful in a different way. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I, I just love this piece. It's beautiful. Grail 13. I, I, I got to pick up one of the Where My Vans Go. They're so expensive now, though. But it's like, do you have one or no? I don't have one. Does Flamingo no. have one? Do you know? Flamingo does not have one. We have been uh, following Drift for a while. And uh, at some point, I think we're, we'll be collecting. Yeah, but, absolutely. But, but Drift is definitely a talent. And he has clearly captured the attention of the space. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful grail. So congrats to everyone that minted grail number 13. And, and Drift, thank you so much for, for sharing your adventure with us. Yeah. Fantastic stuff. All right. Moving on, Nadia Telekonikova, also known as Nadia from Pussy Riot. Yeah, so Nadia, uh, as you mentioned, from Pussy Riot, uh, a conceptual performance artist. I know you've had her on the podcast, Kevin. Mm-hmm. Um, and her practice really touches on these, these topics of freedom and authoritarianism, patriarchy, both utopianism and dystopianism, and those different versions of, of our futures. Um, you know, her work is a combination often of prose and animation and music in some cases as well. Uh, and, and, you know, just sort of such uh, important and deeply entrenched uh, work in her history, which Absolutely. is so cool. I mean, just a modern day, like insane feminist slash activist, like Definitely. locked up by Putin for multiple years, like no joke. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. That's as hardcore as it gets, right? Like that's, that's. Amazing. Pussy Riot was named Women of the Year by Time in 2012. Um, she has a prolific active, activist career, uh, continues to um, wave that banner, even in Web3 as she entered. Um, it was very clear that she was going to bring that part of her with her in every work that she did. Um, and she has been one of the, the leading activists in Web3 since she's uh, co-founded Unicorn Dow. Uh, she has done an um, a, immense amount of work around uh, the war in Ukraine, um, and she has been um, just a loud voice for the causes that she very much believes in and wants to bring attention to and has become just a shelling point around activism in Web3. So it's been amazing to watch her bring her, war- her work, both conceptual and activist-related, into this space. Yeah, and she has a very deep understanding of Web3. Like, this is mm-hmm. no joke. This isn't just playing in this space. Uh, you know, celebrities can come in at times and we all look at, we're like, oh, you're really, you're doing an NFT, but yeah. she's like really deep in the whole space, started her own DAO. Um, it's it's, it's the, pretty amazing. The other thing I'll say is that she's so talented in so many different mm-hmm. things. She's a musician. She, she, her, she, as a conceptual artist, she's a performance artist. Um, she does a lot of stuff and she's very trained in a lot of different mm-hmm. modalities. And so uh, it's been awesome to watch her work in Web3 because she's able to pick and choose her spots. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's get to the reveal. She is Grail number 19. Eat the Scroll is the title. Such a cool piece. Um, I think some people may have sort of uh, started to, to piece it together that this might have been hers. Uh, How did they figure that out? What, what was the giveaway? I, th- I believe she'd done some work with John Cusack. Mm-hmm. And I think this photograph was taken in Chicago when they were working together on some of these projections. And so knowing the proof community, they somehow pieced those together uh, and had this theory that this was, this was Nadia's work. Yeah, so the description is the artwork reflects on some questionable elements in biblical writings on which a number of known right-wing politicians still base their misogynistic and homophobic lawmaking practices the artist suggests them to eat their own scroll and stop harming women and LGBTQ plus bodies based on historical writings. Created by Pussy Riot in Chicago in the spring of 2017. And was a reaction to Donald Trump becoming a president. And this would be her first photography NFT. Yeah, very cool. Fantastic. Well, congrats to all Grail 19 collectors. Next up... Harm van den Dorpel. Yeah, so Harm is a Berlin-based conceptual artist. Uh, he's shown work all around the world. And his work really uh, focuses on these emergent aesthetics ar- around software and language mm-hmm. and how those two sort of fit together in interesting ways. And he pulls from really diverse fields, from genetics on the one hand, 
to sort of blockchain on the other and what that means and how, how those two might intersect. He's shown work in Tokyo, London, Paris, Seoul, Hong Kong, Berlin, uh, across the board. And his project that we're looking at now, uh, Mutant Garden Cedar, has done over $6 million in secondary sales. Yeah. I remember this one hit my radar maybe eight months ago or something like that, maybe a year ago. Yeah. Yeah, very, very cool stuff. Here's some more of his work here. Yeah, I mean, he has such a diverse ability and, and collection. I mean, this work does not immediately look like that first slide and that first mm. collection that we saw, really disparate in many ways. And so I, I love artists that can really explore their practice in such a wide spectrum. Totally. This is beautiful right here. Right. I mean, you wouldn't think this is code. It looks like someone just like took a little bit of a sketch, you know, and just kind of like sketched out real quick with, you know. That's right. It's, it's absolutely stunning. And I wanted to include this one in, a, in the prior slide because it does allude to which grail uh, he contributed. And, and Harm was, was a really excellent and fun con collaborator and contributor here. We went back and forth quite a bit and had a really fun time trying to find a grail that wouldn't be immediately recognizable as, as his work. Yeah. Such a well-known style. I can see how that is challenging with some of these artists, right? Because they give you something, you're like, okay, you're absolutely going to play your hand immediately because you'll know who that is. That's right. And, you know, we give the artist total freedom to explore the mechanic and try something totally novel or pull something from their archives and unearth something. But, of course, sort of with that freedom, you can also submit something that might be more easily recognizable. Yeah. So for this one, we actually have a video to go along with it. Yeah. All right, let's take a look. Hey, hello everybody. This is Harm van den Dorpel. It's a great honor to be included in this Grails 2 drop. Uh, I participate with the work Breezy Doozy. Um, it's a composite drawing. That means it's a drawing that is made from multiple found drawings and some drawings that I made myself. I, I made that in 2011 based on some images that I found on Deviant Arts, which I was studying then in a sort of anthropological way. What makes this work, I think, even more like different is that it responds to the settings of your computer if it's in dark mode or in light mode the image changes or when it's embedded somewhere um, on a marketplace it might even render just as an original black on white drawing what i can also announce is that all the minters of this nft as part of the grails 2 will also be added to the enable list for another nft project of mine called orb light which is a fully on-chain vector gen generated um, animation where the SVG is actually outputted by the Solidity code. So that artwork will live on for as long as Ethereum exists. All right, so here it is, Grail number 15. Yeah, so there was a lot of speculation around this one. I didn't hear anyone uh, suggest harm, and so that's always really fun. Uh, but such an interesting piece. This was the only SVG amongst all the, the Grails. Yeah, so the description here is this work is a 2022 reimagining of a previously unreleased composite drawing I made in 2012. At the time, I was investigating the deviant art community as an outsider, somewhat as a visual anthropologist. The aesthetics that emerge from that community strike me as influential for many degen PFP NFT projects, but then without the financial component. The image is animated with a wavy SVG filter, and it responds to your operating system's settings for light or dark mode appearance. Very cool. Yeah, very cool. And everyone who minted, well, first, congratulations to those who minted this work. I think it's really beautiful and, and, and interesting. Everyone who minted this piece will also be on Harm's allow list for his project, Orb Light. Beautiful work. Uh, and again, a bit more referential to some of those early slides we saw of his work. Um, so, so a really fun benefit of having minted Grail number 15. Yeah. Love it. All right. Let's move on. Cash Poor. Yeah. So, so Kevin, you have some history with Cash Poor. And actually, sort of our community does in an interesting way that we'll talk about in just a moment. So Cash Poor is a project by Jess Machetti. And it really reflects back to some of the early artistic influences in her life. And this work in particular and the work she's exploring here are a reflection of growing up in New York City in the 80s and the sort of pop culture uh, influences of that time in the city uh, and sort of the way that that informed her comfort level in certain environments and her morals and sort of treating the city in some ways as a place of worship. Uh, so really thrilled to have Cashpour involved. And Cashpour, sort of as I mentioned, Jess, uh, is 
perhaps most well-known at the moment as a tattoo artist. She's tattooed people like Bruce Willis, Susan Sarandon, uh, Chris Evans, and you, and Justin. Yes, we did that at the uh, Moonbirds event. Here's her with Bruce right there. But she's just an, an amazing, amazing artist. Like, look at this, this bird here that she did um, that is just fantastic with the cherry blossoms. I mean, really beautiful stuff. And this is her Genesis draw. That's right. So really well known in the NFT, or I'm sorry, in the tattoo community, but making her first move to NFTs. And you can see here's actually a collaboration that she did with Bullet Bourbon during their tattoo series. Yeah. So she actually designed that bottle of bourbon as well. So kind of a breakout artist on that side of the house, more the traditional side and, and uh, the tattoo side, um, but first moved into NFTs. And as a fan of the same stuff, we grew up around the same uh, era, um, love this one, Grail Number 9 from Cash Poor. Mm, yeah, wow. Uh, My Mother the Sun, uh, very, very cool. Created with Procreate and Pixel Studio. Um, she said that she, Cash Poor is a multimedia artist that was born in, has thrived in, and will die in New York City. First NFT, very, very cool stuff. God, this is so cool. I mean, I see the Pac-Man reference. I see the Rubik's Cube, the tape cassettes, the VHS there at the bottom. This is such a cool piece, such a nostalgic piece, and so awesome to see someone who has been um, working in the tattoo art industry for so long now find this space and take their creative energy and bring it over. That's yeah. Right. Yeah, and I think Cashpour is taking you know, the space really seriously. This isn't going to be maybe a one-off, going to explore all sorts of other projects with NFTs and with the space, so really special to have the Genesis NFT here. Yeah, and uh, I know that she's working on a new series around street art as well. That's so. right, so that's gonna be super exciting. Yeah, very cool stuff. Awesome, well, if you wanna get a tattoo from her, you won't be able to get it, but you can definitely get her NFT because you have to wait many months to get, <laughs> get right. on her list and get in given her how popular she is. But yeah, yeah grail number nine. Awesome, thank you, Jess, for being a part of that. Um, process Gray. So Process Gray is the artist behind Truth Labs. They have a couple projects, the Illuminati NFT, the 187, and most well-known probably Goblin Town. Mm -hmm. So really excited to have Process involved in Grails. Uh, you know, through his own words, Process describes his engagement with this space as seeking to cause mischief on the blockchain. I just love that. I think you mm. can see it in most of his work, which is really, really fun. Uh, Goblin Town, of course, I mean, First, this is a beautiful work. Uh, it sort of shows off some of the dynamic work that he has and some of that uh, yes. ability to, to really lean into incredibly detailed illustration, uh, as well as some of the more fun, irreverent Goblin Town work as well. Goblin Town was so creative on, on many different, like, in many different vectors there. The, the website was beautifully, yeah. really well done. And then everyone's like, who the hell is this? And then you go into their Twitter spaces, and it's just a bunch of grunting like goblins. I was like, this is either, either like a, so, someone really creative has to be behind all of this. Like it's yes. too yeah. well thought through, and it just exploded. Like, yes. it's crazy. To understand process is really to also understand like what's going on in the space and why Goblin Town was a success. It really was a response to the NFT space, the Web3 space entering this bear market, and the meme at the time was we're entering Goblin Town. And for Goblin Town to launch, it was stealth launch, it was a, f a free mint, um, and for a community to rally around this very um, subversive, dynamic, interesting, weird thing was so crypto um, and so interesting. And like uh, Process Gray as an artist really captured that, that, um, that energy just through the design work that they were able to pull off. And so I think it's hard to evaluate Process without uh, really understanding you know, Goblin Town, which has been a, you know, a success on, uh, across the board. Yeah, yeah. it's funny. Uh, you know, one of the things we ask the artists is to, of course, keep their participation secret. Mm -hmm. And with process, given Goblin Town, not a problem. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah absolutely. Because yeah. you didn't know for a long time. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That. Yeah. So uh, really fun to work with process. Yeah, I'm very excited to have process actually uh, on the podcast too in a few months because I know they have some new stuff around Goblin Town that we'll be talking about. Amazing. So, very yeah. Cool. All right, well, let's roll. We have a video for this one as well. Yeah, I, I got to say that process is someone, when I look at all the works, that we, especially this next slide we're about to show you in a second, they do just, uh, they're, they're, they're so deep and so complex and so unique. You know, it's like so much skills packed in here. It's so cool. Yeah, look at some of the, like the, can you kind of see the, the woman in the background there? That is the orange. There's like, so much detail. On, yeah, there's a lot of stuff to like kind of go in here and, and pick apart. 
Um, really fun one. Awesome. So congrats to everyone that minted Grail number three, and it's called, the title is Fixer Upper. And then Eli, tell us about this this here. Yeah, so this is really fun. So anyone who minted Grail number three will also get one of these generative characters from Process. And so Process is doing this really small drop of 150 generative characters. And if you minted Grail number three, you'll get an airdrop of one of these guys, and there'll be a snapshot here coming up in a couple of days. Okay, so I can still go on the secondary market and pick one of these up at the time this comes out. You can't. Maybe, Derek, you can. <laughs> Why can't I? <laughs> Maybe you can. Yeah. Um, I want one of these little characters. They're amazing. <laughs> yeah, these are pretty badass. These are I really got, cool. I got to be honest. They're, Look they're at awesome. the lower right. Is that like a female Howard the Duck? Remember that? Like, yeah. I think that's what it is. These are so fun. And, and a you know, really, really cool benefit uh, for minting Grail number three. I love it. Well done. Well, thank you, Process, for being a part of this. Yeah. Very, very cool stuff. All right. Emily Shi. Yeah. So Emily is an outstanding generative artist uh, and engineer living in New York City. Uh, she's maybe most well known for her Art Blocks curated collection, Memories of Chi Lin. Uh, was also just in the Bright Moments uh, release in London with Offscript. Yep. Uh, Derek, I know you're super familiar with yep. both of those collections. Uh, and, and she's shown work again all over the world. And so uh, I think here we're looking at Memories of Chi Lin, a beautiful work. Oh, so beautiful. Yeah. Trained at Harvard um, and has been just a force over this last year in the generative art space. Really draws off of um, East Asian influences, patterns, uh, culture, uh, her, her own culture, and imbues it in the work that she creates. Um, she is definitely a talent and has been, um, has been definitely a, uh, an artist to keep an eye on over the last six months. Yeah. yeah, yeah. it feels like there's, uh, well, you know, everyone in Art Blocks Curated is sort of of the highest standard. And then amongst that, there's maybe this group of slightly more up-and-coming, absolutely incredible generative artists who I think have such a bright future in the years to come. Definitely. She, she's definitely up there. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, she was very nice to, to record a video for us. Let's, let's take a look at that. Yeah. Hello, I'm Emily Shia. I am a generative artist. Usually my work is entirely algorithmic, entirely made with code. For this season of Braille's, I wanted to explore my own algorithms through a different lens. I've been working a lot recently with generative textures and papers and this concept of generative collage. I thought it'd be fun to turn to a manual process and do the real life collage. That's why this piece is called Away From Keyboard. I printed generative textures and patterns of mine onto sheets of paper. Many of these patterns are from memories of Chi Lin. But I also decided to let my hands work the way they wanted to and let myself create new motifs that I still intuitively felt were in the spirit of my code to touch them and cut into them and work with them in that way is a pretty fascinating experience for me. It's blurring the lines between the algorithmic and the physical, manually reenacting my own algorithms and getting to know them in a more intimate sense. Here it is. I mean, wow. When you, when you see that video, how can you not just want to go and collect that? That was the first time I had seen that video, and I have to say I have to get in there and collect one of these. Just to see an artist of her caliber taking the work that she's done in the generative space with procedure and randomness, and now starting to imbue it with like this physical off-chain, away from, from keyboard-type work uh, that includes some of like the pattern-making, and includes mm. some of the quilting, and includes some of this the fabric. Of, uh, of her culture and also of her of her modality and her work and imbue that uh, with a physical piece is just so special and so I'm pretty um, I'm pretty enchanted with this work I have <laughs> yeah. to say it's pretty awesome yeah yeah and we're gonna do something really I think special here one person who minted Grail number seventeen will actually get access to the physical work that Emily showed here at the very end so, so they have a chance to win the actual physical that's right so one person oh, amongst man. those who have minted uh, or who are holding. Derek, 
uh, will get access to the physical. <laughs> I'm going to have to. So if I pick one up, then I can hold it, and they're going to do a snapshot? Yeah, we'll do the same thing. We'll do a snapshot. Every and then I have a chance to shot at one of these. <laughs> like, it, you must be pissed that you sold your pass, or you give, gifted your pass away. No. So cool. They're amazing. Yeah. I mean, I'm so thrilled. Uh, one, to just have Emily in yeah. Grails, to be able to collaborate with her on this, and then her generosity in, in providing the physical to one person who, who minted yeah. or who holds the work. These videos are killing me because every time you do one of these videos, yeah. I want to collect the work. Right, yeah. I mean, it, you know, it's such a good point around storytelling and the importance of that. Uh, and so when you see those videos, it just becomes that much harder yes. not to go out and, and pick up that work. Yeah, so cool. Awesome. Well, Emily, thank you so much. Like, it's uh, such an honor and a pleasure to have you on. Grill number 17. Congrats to everyone that minted it. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. All right, next up, Elida Sun. Yeah. So, Kevin? Yeah, I was just going to say, Elida, like, I guess I, I can jump in. This is someone that I had on the Proof Podcast. Yeah. And I was just absolutely blown away by her in terms of just uh, her thoughtfulness and geekiness mm. and just approach to art and the purity that's there yeah. around the tools that she uses. Mm. Like, it is just like, it's, it's, what you want yeah. in a type of artist like this that yeah. is as a collector. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, she checks every box there. And so I've been a big fan of her work. The little unknown, little secret that we have is that she was in Last Grails mm. and um, we forgot to strip out the eggs of data and it made it revealed who she was. Oh, wow. And so we went <laughs> in and pulled it down and she said, you know, I, I just, I don't have time to like do another whole nother one because. She was purist and wanted to make sure mm. that she was playing the game and like properly hit it. And, um, you know, so we, we punted and said, okay, yeah. next trails, we'll talk to you then. And so I'm, I'm thrilled to have her as part of this. Do you want to give a little bit more background there as well? Yeah, sure. So uh, Elida is an interdisciplinary artist, as you can see from, from some of her work that, that we'll show here in just a moment. It really leans into this sort of post-industrial ethos uh, and design aesthetic. Uh, she's based in Berlin and New York. Uh, and her current practice focuses on this assemblage of extended realities and experimental humanities. I just sort of love uh, those two dimensions of her work. She's maybe most well known for her Art Blocks curated project. Such fascinating uh, work that we're seeing now here, the animation, uh, Glitch Crystal Monsters. Mm -hmm. I am a collector of Glitch Crystal Monsters. I actually have a funny story. So I think she was one of the first or second um, women identifying artists to launch on Art Blocks Curated. Mm. And when her piece came out, uh, I was actually on a road trip with my wife and we had to pull over on the side of the road so I could mint two of these Glitch Crystal <laughs> Monsters. And so I have a fun story uh, that's just uh, paired with, with her work. Exceptional talent, so creative, and from my understanding, um, is most well known for her work in real life that's and right. pairing it with, this, with digital technology. That's right. I mean, some of these interactive uh, and engaging installations that Elida does, uh, where she bridges these different worlds. So interesting. Yes, definitely. Yeah, her installations are, are really fun to, whenever time she posts like a new Instagram video yeah. or something, yeah. I'll go out there and check it out and just be like, oh man, I gotta make a trip to Berlin. Yes. I wanna go out there and actually see these in real life. That's you right. know? So I'm glad that we're actually doing a proof meetup out there yeah. in like another month and change. Yeah. And so we'll be out there for that. And I hope to stop by and see some of her work and yeah. hopefully run into her as well. So. I've actually never seen a picture of her online. She hides her identity <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. quite well. Yeah. Um, there's like shadows of it. So right, like, right. Like she'll have like a shadow of something, and I'm like, I wonder what she looks like. <laughs> it's like I'm always really curious. Yeah. But, um, very, very, very cool artist. Uh, and excited to announce. All right, so grill number 22, Alita Sun, Geist is the title. Uh, quick little portion of the overall uh, description that you'll have to check on the, on the actual NFT. This is made with noise, code, scrap paper, T tape, discarded electronics, graphite. Let's go. And yeah, light come on. It's, it's so good. It's so, so good. Yeah, beautiful piece. I definitely have to pick this one up. And this was the most minted piece. So how many total was minted? Yeah, so 136. That was the highest. Wow, most minted piece. Yeah. Congrats to all the collectors and to Elida. Beautiful, beautiful work. Mm -hmm. I definitely want to pick this one up as well. Yeah. So many I want to get from this collector. <laughs> you did a good job, Eli. Awesome. All right, next up, Pindar Van Armen. Love yeah. Pindar's work. Yeah, and I just love Pindar. <laughs> yeah. uh, such a, a sort of interesting mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was really fun to collaborate on, on some of this thinking around this work 
uh, with, and we'll talk about some of those dimensions in just a moment. So Pindar is a, an award-winning, in many ways pioneering artist with his yes. work with AI. Um, Derek, I know you're super familiar yes. with him. Yes, Pindar is amazing. Uh, as you mentioned, he's just a joy to chat with. Whenever I do video calls with Pindar, I, I'm blessed to sit on the super rare uh, council mm. with Pindar. He always has his, uh, his AI-assisted robot in behind him, and right. sometimes it's actually working uh, <laughs> while he's on the video call. Um, he is someone who blends AI and uh, robotics. Um, he's very well known on Super Air. He's built and established a tremendous audience. Uh, he was one of the, the first actual artists, three artists, to drop on the, the AI platform Braindrops. Right. Um, and uh, Kevin, you recently collected some of Pindar's work. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think that in the future, when AI becomes more and more a permanent fixture mm. of what we're doing in terms of art, I mean, it's already making that leap now. You see with Dolly 2 and everything else, where it's creating these yeah. just ultra-realistic re images based on text inputs. Uh, we'll look back and we'll mm. say, who were the original innovators in the AI art space? And Pindar is Definitely certainly in the top three, right? Yes. And so when I think about who's doing that, this is someone I want to collect for the long term. This is someone I'm going to hold for decades to come. Yeah. And I mean, this piece right here, robot number two, owned by Cosmo. Again, Cosmo making an appearance. Mm -hmm. Really good, very prescient uh, collector. $342,000 was paid for this one on Super Rare. Mm -hmm. um, you know, done a lot of great work with AI and nouns, which is actually, I am a holder of. Yeah. Uh, bit nouns and just all the mm -hmm. stuff that, that he's done here. So, so cool. Yeah, the bit gans, the pod gans, all really fun yes. work. Um, beautiful work here uh, entitled Bonnie. Uh, love Pindar's work. Yes, and definitely check out the, uh, the proof episode we did with Pindar. It was, mm. it was quite good. Um, so, let's get into it. So, grail number seven from Pindar, the title is Quantum Noise. Love this piece. Yeah, so Pindar does not do additions. That's right. And so, what, tell me more about what's going on here. Yeah, so Pindar and I had a lot of fun going back and forth with how we could maybe do something with grails that was not minted as an addition. But as we've talked about, and as you guys both know, the proof community, if it's something, they're going to find it. And so we explored the different ways we could use some of these quantum computing outputs to maybe make something that was imperceivable as being unique, uh, but ultimately decided to mint what uh, here is a common file, meaning everyone minted the same output. But what we're going to do is shortly after uh, this goes live, all of those will switch out no from kidding. one of these outputs that Pindar explored that in many ways are imperceivable as being different, but are functionally and really are one of one generative outputs. Very cool. So let's take a look here. You can see all of them on the screen. Yeah, I love this slide. This is so yeah. good. So basically, you're going to get, even though they look very similar, it actually is behind the scenes a unique one of one from Pindar. That's right. If you really dig in, you can, you can see the differences uh, at the binary. But, uh, you know, again, the challenge to him was really, can I make it imperceivable and viewed in this way? And th those are all unique outputs. It's really, it is. Wow. And so there was some tie into a quantum computer here as well, correct? That's right. Yeah, these were all produced in that way. That's so cool that he's actually using quantum computers now in some of his art. Yeah. It's also really interesting for him to play with this idea of additions, of like them all being the same. But really, if you dive in, they're all different. Yeah. It's almost like uh, this resistance that he's... Mm. Uh, He's, he's conveying across the work, and um, I think there's something so interesting about Pindar, his brain, and uh, it's awesome to see that he worked with you guys to create this unique, uh, dynamic, generative piece. Yeah, and this is pretty unique in that, you know, this is going to be a really small collection, so to speak, because it's only, it's sort of bound by the number of people who minted that work. That's right. But now those are all unique outputs. That's so right. awesome. Yeah, very, very cool twist on this Grail's reveal. Yeah. Uh, fantastic. All right. So moving on. Tom Sachs. Yeah, I mean, so much to say about Tom. Uh, incredibly well known in the traditional art world as a sculptor, probably best known for his elaborate sort of recreations of modern icons. And we're seeing one here, the Tiffany's value meal sold at Christie's. This is really representative of some of the work that Tom is most well known for. I love this. This one sold for a little over $300,000. And what I like about some of Tom's work is you're taking 
a few brands here that typically mm. would not want to be associated with each <laughs> right. other. Yeah. Like, you're, if you're Tiffany & Company, <laughs> like, you're f the furthest from McDonald's yeah. you could possibly be, right? Yeah. So you're high-end jewelry, a luxury <laughs> yeah. brand, and you're putting them on like a value meal. He like, is the master of taking these brands and pairing them with objects that they would never be paired mm -hmm. with and forcing the viewer, the audience, to really reconfigure their associations about what this brand or this object is. Right. It's such a brilliant way uh, to create work, and Tom is just a juggernaut yeah. when, uh, in, this, in this vector, in this area. Yeah, love it. And then, of course, the Rocket Factory. Yeah, so cool. Such a cool piece. You guys have Rocket? Oh, yeah. I love my Rocket. How many? You have one Rocket? I have one Rocket. I have two yep. Rockets. They're they amazing. Assembled? They are fully assembled. <laughs> I have a, um, I have it actually behind me in every one of the episodes that we do. Mm. It's uh, back there in the corner. Um, it's a Franken rocket, so it's all three different parts. I've got the uh, the peanut butter on there. I got the Nike on there, and I got the Lisa Simpson on there. Oh, I love Just that. Just it feels like my childhood in a rocket. Did it's you get it launched? I got it launched. Yep. This and is what it looks like. By the way, for people who don't know what we're talking about, you could assemble these rockets. There were three NFTs: a tail, a mid body, and, and the cone top. You could assemble them, and then if you if you chose, you could have actually have it launch, and you would get the physical as well. Yes. So I have my physical as well. This is not mine, but uh, very cool from from Tom Sachs uh, to to do this project. So totally. creative, yeah. So creative. So Tom has also done obviously collaborations with Nike as well. This yeah, is a very popular one. I know it actually fetches a good amount in the secondary market. Yeah, this is quite recent, and again, sort of leans into Tom's aesthetic applied to a different canvas, right? Yeah, uh, so cool. And all right, all right. Let's get into the reveal. Grail number one. There it is. Belly of the whale. Love it. So this is the entrance to the basement shop where, where he says where all good things are birthed. So is this where the actual rockets were assembled? Or what do we know about this picture? Yeah, so I think this is actually Tom's studio. This mm. is his studio of, of many decades where he's worked uh, in New York City. So very iconic location, important to him. And this is, of course, his first NFT that's a, a photograph. Uh, his other work is, is primarily and solely actually the, the Rocket Factory collection. So this is a really special piece uh, for everyone who minted it. Yeah, just want to say thanks to Tom. I mean, such yeah. an iconic artist to have as part of Grails. Yes. I mean, like the household name in the art world and blue chip artists, like this is, it, it's, it's so great to, to have him appear here yeah. in Grails. So uh, definitely we'll have to collect this one as well. Yeah. All right, moving on. Next artist, William Mapan. Yeah, so William is an artist, coder, and teacher based in France. Uh, his, his work primarily uh, is a commentary on computers and code and the way that that sort of can manifest in different media and across different techniques. Uh, he's probably most well known for Anticyclone, which is the Art Blocks curated mm -hmm. project he released, but also has an outstanding FX hash long form generative project. Uh, called Dragons. Kevin, I know you've collected one yes. of those. Yes, I mean, this, these are beautiful, yeah. right? I, such great work. Um, yeah, I mean, look at this. Yeah, Anticyclone. Derek, I know you've collected some of this I love Anticyclone. Well. I love um, Mapon. He's another artist that I would consider really got his start on, on FX Hash and Tezos and is now starting to build uh, quite the following across the generative art landscape. He is someone who is just a master at the generative art, long form generative art format. Um, his ability to create these unique outputs that are also very diverse from one another, mm. that are all very thematic. Um, he's just a, a, an exceptional, exceptional uh, long-form generative artist, and it's been awesome to watch his, uh, his career unfold. Anticyclone is one that we collected within Flamingo very heavily. I'm a personal collector, and um, it seems like his, uh, his stock in the generative art space mm. is only starting to rise. And I understand he's also an educator in France. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing I love about William's work, and in particular Anticyclone, is it has sort of this textural element mm. to it that I haven't seen uh, a lot elsewhere. You can see it here. Uh, this is sort of something uh, grounding or, or sort of uh, evoking that uh, is, is really interesting here. I love William's work. Yeah, and there's something so cool about mirroring like weather patterns, right? Mm. This idea of like, the, you know, uncontrollable weather and uncontrollable outputs just being mirrored against each other. Um, through a long-form generative art piece that's just so interesting with Anticyclone. Yeah, just beautiful stuff. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's great to see. He looks like a pretty young artist. Do we know how old he is? I don't know how old William is, but, but I think you're right. Like he's sort of in the sort of 20s to 30s, 
uh, range. So one of the, the younger artists. Yeah, and it's also great to see another black artist represented here on stage as 100%. well. 100%. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. All right. Let's do it. So Grail, number 18, William Upon, The Guardian. I love this work. Uh, this is the, the first output for an upcoming long-form generative project that William's working on. So a really special piece. And congratulations to everyone who minted this. Yeah, I think that's really uh, important to unpack there for a second. Like, this is going to be a much larger collection now, or like later. And so owning this grail means you're owning the very first kind of Genesis piece to that collection. Like, that's, mm. that's huge. It's awesome. That's right. Yeah, I mean, so you get a beautiful piece of art in and of itself. You get to collect a piece from William. But then to your point, Kevin, sort of has this other dimension, making it really important. Yeah, fantastic. This is certainly someone that when I think about the artists that I want to track, yeah. that I want to pay close attention to and watch yes. what they're doing, very short list of people fall into that camp. He is one of them for Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. Yep. All right. Next up, Rafik Anadol. Yeah. So Rafik is, he's a heavy hitter. I mean, Rafik's work is distinct and has been shown all around the world in some incredible IRL settings. And his work in particular, it comes alive. And so when shown both digitally and in real life at galleries uh, and elsewhere, it feels alive. I mean, look uh, at this. Here, this is a perfect example. Just stunning. This is very cool. So cool. And Rafik's worked with Microsoft, Google, uh, Intel. He sort of is able to skirt across a bunch of these different domains and disciplines in such an interesting way. He's another of these incredible creative minds willing to sort of push the boundaries uh, and see what's possible here. What I love about Rafik too, I had the, uh, the pleasure of sitting next to him at a dinner recently, um, and his work is so, um, so inspired by data mm. and so inspired by um, unlocking things that are unseen currently with the naked eye. He wants to you know, push boundaries as it relates to smell or taste or feel or, or how we get immersed within art itself. I know some of, his, um, some of his collections have done tremendously well mm -hmm. in crypto. I know he counts Bill Gates as being one of his earliest collectors. Um, and he is actually working on a massive, massive project that's bridging the work he's doing in AI uh, with Web3 uh, with a project called Dataland, where, where the, the first location will actually be out here in Los Angeles. Mm. So that's a project to be tracking of Rafiq's. Mm -hmm. Very cool. I, I love this. And I, I'm curious, do we know much about the creative process? If not, I got to get him on the podcast because I'm curious, like behind yeah. the scenes, what tools go into actually pulling this off? Because it's, it's just beautiful. Yeah. And he's given me a quick tour of his studio through Zoom. They have all sorts of cool tools and 3D printers and massive screens. They're really doing some amazing things there. Yeah. It'd be fun to do a, a little video tour of yeah, the studio. Yeah, It'd be great. All right. So by now, you probably guessed. Grail number eight. And Derek, this was your piece. This was my piece. I, I was so, um, we, we randomly minted ours. And so I was so blessed to have uh, been able to mint a Rafik. I actually don't own any Rafik's work. So I was super grateful to mint number eight. And what I'll say is I love this piece because it plays with this idea of, of um, organic matter and, and this liveness with mm. like very clearly this very hard, uh, con constricted boundary. It, it plays with the tension between um, human and computer and AI in, in this really interesting way. There's also this, I don't know if this was intentional, but there's this almost like a bar chart, a price bar chart at the very bottom, mm. which kind of, uh, for me at least, just illuminates some of what's happening in Web3 around price being associated with a lot of these outputs. Um, but the piece itself is just so striking. And another one, another work that I just need to see blown up. I need yeah. to see this big. I need yeah. to see it immersed on a 40-foot wall in front of me. Yeah, I mean, well, you have that frame in your house, right? Like I do. You put this on that frame. It's not 40 okay. feet, but it, is, uh, yeah. but it is big. Yeah, so I'm yeah, definitely projector putting... would be killer for something like yes. this. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful stuff. Yeah, I love that piece. Yeah, this is another one where I would say, in terms of just glancing at all of them when I first had a look through, of all the pieces once they hit the site, I was like, I, I didn't know most of the artists at that point because you kept them pretty yeah, hidden. Yeah. I knew who some of the names were, but sure. obviously I can't connect the dots either because they're doing a good job hiding them. Yeah. And I looked at this one, I was like, damn, that's hot. That's, that's cool. like really good. Yeah. You know? Well, I love that this was the last submission too. This was the last one to go up on the website. Super impactful and beautiful piece. Yeah. Great, great stuff. All right, Rafiq, thank you so much for, for contributing to Grails and, and congrats to everyone that collected it. Yeah. That was number eight. 
Next up, Alpha Centuri Kid. Yeah, so ACK, uh, incredible body of work. Uh, one of the higher selling super rare artists with their one of ones. Uh, incredible collector base from X Copy to 6529, uh, curated. And uh, it was really fun. You, uh, ACK and I had some back and forth on the work that they ultimately ended up submitting. And when we were talking about, was there any type of bio they wanted me to, uh, to describe themselves uh, through, the only thing I got was humble servant of the muse, which I absolutely yeah. love and is so poignant. Super cryptic, right? Like yeah. you don't get a whole lot there. And I love that. Yeah. I love that. That actually brings a lot to sort of my engagement, I think um, others' engagement with the work. And that comes through in many different facets as you can um, see here, I mean, he plays with this idea of like the meme culture around Web3. I think I just saw the Ringer Goose yes. fly up out of the right. pit. Uh, we've got the Rubik's Cube there. He's very much on the nose with pop culture. There's this dark, there's like this darkness about ACK that I just yeah. love. I know folks have really related him to X Copy, and I know X Copy is actually a collector of his. Um, but there is something so spooky and dark about ACK and his work, but yet so fun yeah. and so, so crypto native that I just love. Uh, I'm so excited to see who, uh, what, what, what Grail he he created here because I'm shocked that he's even in this collection. Yeah, and, and this piece here I think sold for 165 ETH, so he's had some you know really massive sales on Super Rare. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's do it. Let's take a look. He was Grail number 11. Ooh, wow. Okay, so at first I thought this was you. No. Yeah, that was the joke. That was the running joke on Discord right. that I was. I would, because my last name is Rose, do a Rose is my mm. first empty drop. I do not have this skill set to pull this off. No, beautiful work. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely beautiful stuff. And it's interesting because looking at it beforehand, I don't think you would say this no. is an ACK. No. But once you know, yes. you start to pick out some of those elements and some of those palettes that you say, okay, I see that. Mm. Yeah, I love this. I, I love that the name has made these for your girl. It's just... It's, it's so ACK, yeah. just in-your-face, uh, just, um, yeah, totally subversive, totally awesome, uh, very funny. Um, and, yeah, I'm shocked that this is, uh, this is the work that he, he, he's running with because I think it, it's such a great juxtaposition to the, his other work that we know him by. So he really leaned into the, um, the Grail's medium here yeah. and really played with expectations, which yeah. I love. It's, it's great. The description is, she deserves it. <laughs> I made this because I was having a sad day and needed something pretty to look at. So I love it. awesome. It's, it's the best. This is a really special piece. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Alpha Century Kid, thank you so much uh, for being uh, part of this Grails release. Yeah. Beautiful piece. All right, next up, Zancan. Yeah, so, so Michael Zancan is a generative artist from Bordeaux uh, in France. And he's been both sort of a painter and a programmer sort of playing in both of those worlds for over four decades. And his work is really distinct. And for me in particular, sort of, I really gravitate towards it because of those, uh, those natural elements that I don't see often in generative work, uh, both in terms of the palette and the output itself, some of the foliage that, that comes through in his generative work, uh, really distinct and beautiful. Yeah, look at this stuff. I think Zantan's, uh, again, yeah. one of these generative artists who is really someone that I want to collect and watch in the next couple he, of years. He is a, he's a total juggernaut right now. I think he may be the top selling artist of all time on Tezos. Um, his collections um, have, have, I think he's got three of the top selling collections of all time on FX Hash. Yeah. He is a generative artist that is just on, like on a rocket ship right now and people just want to collect his work. Um, I would say he, the, something he does so well is play with this idea of I think he's inspired um, by like the pen plotter, mm -hmm. which is like, you mm -hmm. can see um, a lot of the work that he's created has sort of like this plotted uh, feel where it's like hand drawn. Uh, there's also something very like, uh, he plays with nature very well. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's something about this tension between computer art and rules mm -hmm. and, and nature and like using the, uh, um, you know, a format that looks like hand drawn, pencil, pen, mm -hmm. uh, described on, on paper. Uh, that's just so elegant and so well done. Um, and he is a, yeah, he's a tremendous talent and, and has been someone that uh, I'm looking forward to collecting in the future. Yeah, and I've started collecting him in the last probably six months, mm. really drawn to his work. I think, you know, again, someone really to, to watch here in the next couple of years. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, for this one, we have a video. 
to make this NFT, I went back to my algorithm for trees, the exact one that I had been working on a year ago, and which is responsible for my Genesis piece, the oak tree minted on foundation. I was looking for a figuration in generative art back then, with the constraint that the art had to be plottable. It means that it has to be made of lines. When you work with lines, you might need a hidden lines removal algorithm. It allows you to cut the lines that are behind the shape. I have such an algorithm. It's a custom one. It's deceptively simple and powerful. And it doesn't use any math, actually. It's at the core of all of my works. And I kind of keep it secret for that reason. For the tree bark, I developed a pattern that is mapped onto the cylindrical volume of trunk and branches, and this is what you see here. But then, what if you turn off the hidden lines algorithm? The pattern of each branch will pile up and you will start to lose the idea of shapes and volume, which is exactly what the mind needs to figure out what it's looking at. Removing the idea of shapes and volume makes you drift from figuration to abstraction, for Graves, I needed an abstract piece in order to cover up my tracks. By looking at this work in progress, you can guess that you are looking at a tree, except that the parameters are set to absurd values. The diameter of branches is bigger than their length, and you get this gathering of tree logs, which are starting to look like lace or fabric. The number of layers is painful to watch. Usually when you make code for pen plotters, you try to optimize the plotting time as much as possible. I did the exact opposite here, which was absurd. And we ended up with a plotting time of 12 hours straight. The piece is called the Fabric of Trees, and it comes with this physical drawing, which is unique, because to be honest, I don't want to do it again, ever. Wow, so good. So that physical is going to be raffled off to, to one holder, right? That's right. As Zankan said, that's not something he wants to do again. So there's one of those physicals, and one person who minted this work will, will ultimately get that. How many people minted this one? Yeah, 75 people. So one of those 75 uh, will get this incredible physical one of one that we just saw. And, it, and if I heard correctly, it took 12 hours to plot that piece out. That's right. I mean, I can understand why he doesn't want to do that yeah. again. Uh, so that makes the physical so special. Yeah. It, this is one of these artists where, you know when you, you take a look at the body of work from an artist, and there's sometimes, there's artists I'm attracted to where they almost can do no wrong, mm -hmm. right? Like X Copy for me is one of those where I'm just like, okay, I love yes. pretty much everything. I mean, there was a couple tank ones there that they did that, you know what I'm talking about, where yes. I was like, ah, maybe that one's not for me. But everything else was amazing. But this is one of those artists where I look yeah. at Zankan's work and I'm just like, I want it all. Yeah, it, yeah. Is, it is really that good. Yeah. All right, so that was grail number 25. Zancan crushed it. Amazing. So awesome. The fabric of trees. All right, moving on. Chettle Golit. Yeah, this is a big one. So Chettle is a generative artist uh, who blends sort of algorithm and data structures in a really interesting way. Uh, Chettle approaches most of their work from this question, which is, what would it look like if? I sort of love that framing of a way to engage with something new and something novel to explore mm. what could be. So I just sort of love that framing. Chetel is probably most well known for Archetype, which yep. is the Art Blocks curated project, uh, has done over $19 million in secondary sales, I think has a 25 ETH floor at the moment. We're seeing some examples now. Yeah, and Chetel is really your, your favorite um, algorithmic artist's favorite algorithmic artist. Yeah. He is a guy who open sources all of his work after he launches a script. Um, he lets the viewer e explore the work, not just as it's visually seen, but then the code that was used to create the work itself. He's very well known for creating a lot of documentation and for really open sourcing his whole creative process behind creating the algorithm itself. Uh, he's also launched a, another Artblocks piece on the Artblocks Playground uh, called Paper Armadas, which was a very, very fun project. I think 
between archetypes and paper armadas, it's also clear he's a master of palettes. Mm. His palettes are just so compelling yeah. and so rich with color. Yeah. Uh, he is just a phenomenal talent. So you own a bunch of his pieces? I own a bunch of his um, his paper armadas and archetypes, yes. How big are your bags there? What, how many are we talking? I, not, too, not too big. I think I maybe own a dozen of the paper armadas and I think two or three of the archetypes. I mean, that's a pretty big size <laughs> bag. <laughs> it's a pretty big size bag. So Flamingo has some as well? or Flamingo no? has a bunch uh, okay. of, uh, of Kettle's work. Um, very special talent and yeah. is clearly someone that a lot of new artists that come into space look to for inspiration. Yeah, fantastic. All right, well, let's roll the video. I love that we get these behind the scenes videos that show you know the process. So what are we seeing right here? Yeah, so we're sort of seeing that final output starting to, to come to shape, right? And, and starting to form and I'm not sure if it's quite clear yet, but this is starting to elude what the, to that final output that people minted. Uh, really interesting to see this in progress. Yeah, it's fascinating. It's like a little virus growing or something. It's crazy. Yeah, this is so special. Just to see the, the liveness of this work um, through time is, is really special. Um, you can really start to see it coming alive. Yeah, so cool. All right, so this was grail number six. Crude Figures is the, the title of the grail. Yeah, this is such a special piece. Again, uh, Chettle, thank you so much. And, and anyone who minted this, I, you know, just such a beautiful piece. It says here, the imperfect restorations of the same picture. Each restoration has limited information and a limited ability to reassemble the pixels correctly. This is a reutilization of a pixel sorting algorithm I made a few years ago. The combination of applying it on a relatively simple image and doing it multiple times makes the workings of the algorithm more apparent. The attached video shows how the algorithm works, repeatedly swapping pixels to recreate the original image. Amazing. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, Chettle really, as you can see here, leaned into the mechanic around Grails. And, you know, I think in particular, this one was pretty hard to identify as his work. Mm -hmm. So uh, really fun. And, and I sort of love to see uh, the way that different artists engage with that mechanic and explore other dimensions, old dimensions of their work. This is a, a, an example of, and there's a few of these in this collection, where I'm like, I got to go back mm. and record an episode yes. just directly with this artist yeah. to go in depth because yep. you know there's just a, a richer, deeper side yeah. to the creative process, the algorithms involved, yeah. all of that. There's a story to be told there for sure. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, this one's so cool. For me, what's coming up is like this use of repetition mm. and the fact that these are all so diverse and different. It's almost like the futility of repetition and procedure uh, we can't control this. It's mm. almost like no matter what, at the end of the day, these things are all unique and organic and different. And um, I just love that he's playing with that tension. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you for being part of it. And congrats to number six, uh, the mentors of number six. So that was grail number six. Let's move on. Just a couple left. All right. Here we go. Coldy. Yeah, so Coldy is another sort of heavy hitter. Uh, OG in the space, and really responsible for some of the, the early work and also some of the uh, best practices that have sort of become uh, what we know and how we interact with the space. So royalty uh, being, being one in particular and a 10% secondary. That was something Coldy sort of really helped initiate for artists in the early days. Um, he's done almost $5 million in secondary sales on Super Rare. Uh, this piece that we're looking at now sold for 87 ETH, uh, really uh, distinct work, and the mix of animation and collage mm. and sort of leaning into crypto art, so fascinating. Yeah, there's this really funny uh, story. I was you know, digging through old articles recently and just learning a little bit more about Coldy, and he is certainly a crypto art pioneer and also someone that really pioneered this 3D stereoscopic mm -hmm. work. Um, uh, there was a, 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 an interview that he was doing, I think it was with Art Gnome, and he was describing that he wished that everybody would carry around with them those like paper mm. 3D glasses so that the work he met, made could be enjoyed in different right. ways. Um, and because that wasn't true, he had to develop this own method by which his art could be enjoyed in 3D. And so what we're viewing here and the work that he's created is very much his process around creating this 3D 
liveness around mm. the work itself, yeah. which is pretty compelling. Yeah. I would say out of all of the big collectors that I know in the NFT space, there isn't one that says that mm. they either don't already have a Coldy and are proud mm. of it, or they want to own one. Yeah. Yes. Because this is, when you go back historically, and I know we're just a few years into this, into this whole crypto NFT thing, but talk about the handful of artists that were there from the get-go. Mm -hmm. Like, Coldy is one of them. Oh, right? yeah. Totally. So this is, it, it's an important piece for me. Uh, I, I want to collect this piece as well. Um, but before we get in there, he did a really fun <laughs> yeah, this is fun. remix with Moonbirds and some X copy. And I actually had to buy one of these and bought one from our company wallet as well and did a giveaway mm. uh, for, for one of the, our lucky winners on the Discord. I love that. Uh, got a piece of this as well. So thank you, Coldy, for doing that. Uh, Coldy, grail number four. Grail number four. Yes. So tell us a, a little bit about this one here. Yeah, so this is really interesting. And uh, again, sort of the proof community, we're able to identify the concert this photograph was taken at, uh, the date, of course. Um, but I didn't hear many guesses that this was ultimately Coldy. Mm. Um, but I, he's got a fascinating description of this work. Yeah, so this one was taken at a Tame Impala slash Flaming Lips Halloween concert in 2013, so qu quite the crowd there. Uh, the description is, the night was the most wild concert I photographed from an audience perspective for sure. Being from Australia, Tame Impala were unaware of the USA's Halloween tradition and were good sports and dressed up in drag as the Spice Girls. The Flaming Lips reenacted the blood-drenching scene from Carrie, truly odd. I love it. So let's take a look here at actually what this turns into, which yeah. of course you add that little twist there, the uh, the stereoscopic three D um, effect, and you know everyone would guess that was a cold. Yeah, right? that's so right. He pulled that out, just made it uh, a flat image, and of course it the little signature in the corner, which is also awesome, and that is. The Coldy. So cool. Yeah, you are so a mentor cool. of Grill number four. You, hold, you own a Coldy now, which is awesome. That's right. And so uh, the image that was minted will actually get swapped out for this GIF. So that will replace that PNG that, mm. that people currently hold. And they'll also get access to be able to unlock that 3D version of this work. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, I just have to say, you guys totally crushed it in terms of um, taking it a step further with Grails too. I, something that's just been, as we've gone through this today, that's been apparent to me is, what you see is no longer necessarily what you're getting. Mm -hmm. Like there is this playfulness and this um, this experience that can happen after the mint. And so, in future grails, I think people are now going to be attuned to the fact that you know there is some depth to what's happening here around these mints, and to not be so fooled or um, assume that what you're seeing originally is what you're getting. Yeah. Well, yeah. we have so many other. We've talked about. Some yeah. I can't <laughs> wait. Stuff coming yeah, yeah. out to see it. future grails. It's yeah. going to get even it's wilder awesome. in the future. Yeah. All right, so we are down to that final grail. And as you all can imagine, everyone knows at this point, it is grail number 14, which was minted how many times? Uh, 50 times. 50. And I love that it's a clean 50. A clean 50. Clean 50. So who could this be? Let's uh, roll a little video. Hey, friends. Uh, Eric, a.k.a. Snowfro here. Uh, thank you for minting my grail number 14. Uh, I wanted to show you guys something um, pretty cool. So my family uh, moved into a house last year and had a shop. And, and in that shop was a kiln. And ceramics are something that I've always been pretty excited about. Uh, I just never really had the time to get into it. Um, and so First thing I did is buy some clay and started making some pots and I found it to be incredibly relaxing. And um, yeah, so I created this piece by using these two pots. Um, you can kind of see a stamp at the bottom there. So for like my friend Tom Sachs recommended, who's also big into ceramics. Uh, and yeah, the, the idea here was that I, I put these pots on top of a generative algorithm, a generative algorithm that I created in 2018 for releasing Art Blux. Um, but I just felt that that algorithm in and of itself, just by itself, just wasn't impactful enough to be released as its own release. And so I have this algorithm that generates those background colors 
And I really like the way that the ceramics looked on top of it, especially because I thought the colors vibed pretty well. Um, and something that inspired me to create a series or to start exploring creating a series where my goal down the road is to make a you know, hundred of these different sizes and colors and have an algorithm kind of select them at random and place them on top of a randomly generated uh, background like the one that you see there. So this one that you that you see uh, with grails, I uh, manually added a drop shadow to the piece because there was no, it was just a top down photo of the piece taken. And um, I'm hoping to do it all algorithmically in the future. Anyways, thank you uh, for minting grail number 14 for those that did. And thank you, uh, Kevin and Eli, for letting me participate in this awesome uh, experiment. Ah, oh, so cool. Woohoo! <laughs> Unreal. Yeah. So this is important for a handful of reasons. Yeah. I mean, obviously, it's Snowfro, who is the creator of the Chromie Squiggle, uh, the very genesis drop for Art Blocks, and this is his very next piece after doing the Chromie Squiggle, uh, Grail number 14. There is so much that I love <laughs> about this work. Uh, let me just say, you know, for you guys to have been able to work with Snow and to be able to get him to launch a grail uh, is tremendous on your part because he is so deliberate about the work that he creates. He is very much of the belief um, of, I mean, he is very deep in his own creative journey and his own creative process. And for him to trust you guys in the platform and to be able to launch one of these sacred grails says a lot about the, the platform that you've built here. The next thing I'll say is, um, I am just a massive fan of his use of color. Mm. The script that he wrote, uh, that he he wrote, and uh, that we see beneath uh, the ceramic itself, it's it's so snowfrow. It's so much playing with this this, this idea of gradients and color uh, and palette. Uh, he's just a very colorful person. He injects it through all of his work. Mm -hmm. And for this also to have been a piece that he was considering launching art blocks with, yeah. in addition to the chromy squiggle, says a lot about him coming full circle in his journey. But also looking out to the future. I mean, it's hard not to see. The fact that we have this physical bowl hmm. on top of this generative piece and the pairing of which that may illuminate some of where art blocks may go in the future or where may he, he may go as an artist and a creative. Yeah. And so this is such a, an important piece for a variety of reasons. Over the moon excited about this one. You're going to go collect this. 100%, <laughs> yeah. Unquestionably. Yep. So what do you think about this idea that he has here around physicals mm. with generative? Like you, you said, it, it may allude to like where this goes. Yeah. Where do you think this goes? Yeah, so it's, it's hard not to look at generative art and see its core principles of, of this idea of injecting randomness and procedure mm. and rules into some final output um, and not think that there's a use case or a, a massive application set for those primitives in the real world. Mm. And that can take the form of ceramics, it could take the form of uh, architecture, it could take the form of, of wood making, it could take the form of virtually anything that has requires inputs and uh, you know, creates some output. You know, today, it's much more easier to manufacture thousands of one thing. In the future, as we inject these randomness and mm. this procedure into things, it's not a stretch to see art blocks or you know, the randomness and procedure that drives a lot of the algorithmic art that we see today being used for other cases that are off-chain. And so marrying the on-chain and the off-chain to me is just the next evolution of this technology. And Snow is playing with this idea by injecting randomness and procedure in his ceramic work with the algorithmic work that he's done in the past. And so if you view Squiggle like I do as an instructional piece mm. that allowed generative artists to see what was possible with crypto-based on-chain generative art, it's you can also make the same, you know, you, know, uh, you can look at this ceramic piece here mm. and see like maybe this is his instructional piece about where he's going as an artist mm. or where art blocks is going or where the industry is going. Right. Yeah. So a very important piece here. Yeah. So that's really, I mean, you guys are really tight. Yeah. And what's interesting about this is, is you're kind of saying in essence that stay tuned, this could be a little preview into the future. I can't, I'm not one to predict the future, but what I will say is Eric Snowfro is very excited about the world of possibilities when you start taking this on-chain behavior and applying it to some of the off-chain mm. stuff that we all love and enjoy. Yeah, so we all got really pumped up and excited to go to Mexico City because that's going to be his next generative piece. Yes. It's going to be there. We got a little early taste here. <laughs> yes, yes. Very excited that, uh, that he was able to do this work with you guys. Yeah. Very special piece. This is awesome. Well, here's a little thing that you may not know at this actually, mm. but he actually turned me down for Grails 1. 
Oh, yeah, man. Yeah, so I, I came after him and approached him for the first grails. I didn't know that. He's like, hmm. he's like, no, not, not, not doing anything. Like, you, you, to your point, he's very deliberate about yeah. this stuff. He thinks through it. And, um, you know, the first grails went, went great. And then he was like, okay, I'm in. So, oh, that's so awesome uh, to hear. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, this is a, a great one to end with. Yeah, this is big. Yeah, congrats to anyone that minted grail number 14. I am 100% uh, picking this one up. Please uh, be gentle on me on the floor prices out there. Uh, <laughs> I, I am considering trading squiggles for this for those who are interested. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, but also yeah. may just have to hit the secondary market. Yeah. Yeah, it's awesome. And, and once he's in, he was all in. Oh, he's like super collaborative. and like, he, He's so great, right? And you guys both know this. Uh, very collaborative, texting, emailing, really engaged with the whole process. Uh, you know, really thrilled and, and so grateful to Eric for his contribution. Yeah. This is, yeah, this is such an important piece. I think yeah. outside looking in, we all see his genius mm -hmm. and what he's been able to do, both with Chromey Squiggle and the way it's resonated. Art blocks the platform and it's massive success. But I think what people don't also realize is he's not just you know this brilliant mind. He's also one of the kindest people right. in this space. Uh, Eric is someone that must be protected at all costs. We have to protect the guy, and so uh, yeah, we he's 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 amazing, amazingly special and super kind. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you so much for for co-hosting this with me, guys. Yeah, that was great. This has been awesome. There's, uh, we we Thank should you. say, yeah, that's awesome, Derek. We should say that there is, um, there's more of these to come. That's right. So we're going to be continuing and actually now uh, putting Eli even under more pressure. <laughs> that's right. On future Grails. Yeah. Um, so we'll have more announcements around that at the Future Proof. That's right. Uh, around the, the cadence and some other applications for where we could take this whole idea of guessing what's behind the mint, because um, there's a bunch of different ways you you could see us apply this technology. So. Very exciting, uh, great way to end. Yeah. And uh, congrats to everyone out there that minted. Thank you for playing this uh, game along with us and for paying attention to the art. Like yeah. we're actually looking. Right. Like the cool thing about this is it forces people to go in and consider the art and That's talk right. about the artists and even the ones that aren't in this. Yeah. I, oh, I thought that was an X copy. I thought this was that. Like there's been probably more artists mentioned <laughs> That's and broadened the conversation as just the, the nature yeah. of doing this. And so it gets people paying attention to other artists and actually gives us some ideas for who we might want sure. to do in the future, yeah. right? So it's just a really fun process. And uh, I'm excited we're going to be doing more of these in the future. Yeah, 100%. All right. Well, that is it for now. Thank you for joining us for this live stream and uh, hope you uh, chose wisely. We'll see you again here soon. Sure.